Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldy, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldy. Okay, it's good to have everybody in again this afternoon and on a beautiful day in Oklahoma. And uh, for those of you out in television, we just want to welcome you to a Bible study that we try to keep informal. We don't want to get uh, too theologic about it, and uh, we want to keep it down to a level where most anyone can comprehend it. And uh, again, I just want to thank you from the depths of my heart for all your letters, and especially coming through the holiday season, for all your greeting cards, and for your prayers, and of course we have to thank you for your financial support. It does cost money. But uh, we leave that in the Lord's hands. All right, now I think if I have opened a lot of people's eyes to one concept of Bible study is that you always determine first and foremost to whom is the scripture that you're reading addressed. Is it addressed to Israel? Is it addressed to the Gentile church? And uh, that just solves a multitude of problems. Now, we're in the little letter of James, and we'll be going on in the days ahead to the other little, what we call Jewish epistles, James and First and Second Peter, First, Second, and Third John, Jude, and Revelation. And those are all primarily written to the Jew. Now, if you'll come back with me to James chapter 1, verse 1, just for a little review and to make the point that these little letters are not written to the Gentile church like Paul writes Ephesians and so forth to us where he says Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ writing to you Gentiles no here we got just the opposite James says a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes now language can't make it any plainer than that well now where were these twelve tribes that James is addressing. Well, turn the page or two over to 1 Peter, and you've got the same scenario, only now Peter gives us a geographical area. You got it? 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 1. Peter is writing, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers, in other words, the Jews of the dispersion, and where are they? Scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, where are all those geographical areas? Well, in what we today call the land of Turkey. The land of Turkey was where Paul labored the most in Galatia and Ephesus on the western coast. And then you take those seven letters in uh, the churches to Revelate in the book of Revelation. They're all in what today is the land of Turkey. Now, the reason that so many of these Jews are being written to in that area of the world is going back to Christ's earthly ministry, that those Jews who had become believers that he was the Messiah, of course, were incorporated in what we call that Jerusalem assembly. And then after Christ ascended back to glory, Peter and the eleven keep on preaching to the Jews in the area of Jerusalem and Judea, and that Jerusalem assembly of Jewish believers grew and grew to where it was probably several thousand, because you know what, 3,000 on the day of Pentecost alone. And then in comes old Saul of Tarsus with his intense persecution. And so what happened to those thousands of Jews in Jerusalem? They scattered for their life. And evidently, the biggest percentage of them went up into Asia Minor, or what is today Turkey. And so these Jewish congregations that are now established up there in, in Asia Minor and Galatia and so forth, and they have formed little congregations patterned after the Jerusalem church. Now there's not one word, and I have to emphasize this without apology, there is not one word of Paul's doctrines in these little epistles. There's not a word regarding the Gentiles. There's not a word regarding the body of Christ. There's not a word regarding the power of the gospel of death, burial, and resurrection. It's all patterned for these Jews scattered out there and practicing their, their messianic faith along with legalism. They're still adherents of the law. They'll still go to the temple whenever they get a chance. 
But here they've been scattered because of the persecution arising around Stephen and so forth. Now, the other point I like to make is, as we did in those earlier programs introducing these epistles, they all thought, the writers of Scripture assumed, that all of this was going to be winding up in a few years and the Lord would come and set up His kingdom. Now, don't lose sight of that, that all of these Jewish believers are looking for the soon coming of the Messiah, the kingdom. But before the Messiah could return, what had to happen? The tribulation. And the tribulation was just as much a promise of suffering and turmoil and persecution as what we're looking at today. All right, so if you'll reflect back now on one of the first programs I introduced these letters, I made the point that these letters are written to Jews facing imminent trials and persecutions of the tribulation, waiting for Christ to come. But Christ didn't come, and God set everything out in the future. And so I thought of it in, in a concept last night. Iris knows I didn't sleep much last night, I guess because of this afternoon. But I, I came to this, this concept that once it was established that the, the Old Testament prophecies now were going to be interrupted and God is going to turn to the Gentile world and call out the body of Christ for now almost 2,000 years, we have come full circle. And that's the way I'm going to present it. From the time that God left off dealing with the nation of Israel, sent him into dispersion, opened up the age of grace, and now after 2,000 years we have come full circle and we are right back to almost the same scenario. Oh, I know it's different population-wise, whereas back then the world's population was probably 500, 600 million at the most. Today we're over 6 billion. Back there, of course, they still fought with swords and spears and animals were their chief uh, beasts of burden and today we've got all our technology. But in the realm of geopolitics, in the realm of economics, in the realm of empires, in the realm of Israel's position in the land, and now the prospect of the tribulation coming, hey, it's almost Deja vu, as old Casey Stengel said, what? All over again. Deja vu, all over again. And so now these letters are so appropriate for Jews who will be Messianic believers as the tribulation approaching. And so these, you watch for it. The reason I'm doing all this is so as we go on through it now, you can see what I'm talking about that there's this constant reference to the law, there's this constant reference to get ready for pressure. Get ready to suffer for your faith. Well, yes, they were in that scenario back there in the Roman Empire, and now we're right back again. I hope you're watching Western Europe. You know, I've been telling my classes for 30 years, watch Western Europe. That's your revived Roman Empire. And out of that revived Roman Empire is going to come all the events associated with the Antichrist and the Tribulation and so forth. Now, I've got a gentleman, I've referred to him before, and uh, Charles must spend hours in some big library, and he sends me clippings from newspapers from all over the world. And uh, he sent me one the other day that just almost made me hit the ceiling because over the last couple years when the European community has now been expanding from the 10, 12, 14, 15, and last week another bunch was added to it. And I suppose a lot of people thought, well, Les was wrong. He thought the 10 nations of the uh, beginning of the Club of Rome and so forth was going to be the 10 toes of Daniel, but it can't be because now there are almost 20. This is what he read. He sent me an article out of the Financial Times in London. And this big wheel in the European community said, oh yeah, we're growing in numbers. But he said, we will always rest on the 10. And isn't that exactly what I've always said? I said, I don't care how many nations go into the European community. 
the original ten are going to be like veto power in the United Nations. And so watch Western Europe as well as the Middle East. And so here we've come, I'll repeat myself, we have now come full circle, and here we are, Israel back in the land, the Roman Empire is reappearing, and the whole, like I said, the geopolitical and the economic and the religious systems and everything are almost back to where we were, on a grander scale, of course, far, far more people involved, but in generalities, it's almost deja vu. All right, now with that as another rehearsal of the introduction, James chapter 1, and let's jump at verse 22. Jerry's got verse 24, which is all right. Now, for those of you watching the program out on television, if you're interested in today's programs or so forth, it'll be in book number 53. Book number 53. I thought of it, didn't I, Annie? <laughs> okay. Now back to James chapter 1, verse 22. Now watch the language. Oh, what a difference from Paul's epistles of grace. James says, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. All right, now let's go all the way back to Exodus. All the way back to Exodus, chapter 19. Because I want you to see how this hooks up so perfectly with everything Jewish, the nation of Israel. Exodus 19. And you can drop in at verse... Seven, honey? Exodus 19, and we'll look at verse 7. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord... Now remember the scenario. Moses is up in the mountain, face to face with the Lord. In chapter 20, he's going to get the Ten Commandments. But now the Lord has just been telling him how he's going to deal with the nation of Israel, fresh out of slavery. All right, so verse 7 again. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. Now verse 8. This is the verse I want you to see. And all the people, now remember, this is the nation of Israel. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will... What's the next word? Do. See? And what is it? Works. Works. We're not going to wait for salvation to be accomplished and take it as a free gift. We'll work for it. All that you've said, we'll do. See? And it's repeated again in Deuteronomy. But we won't take time to stop there. Come back again to James. So watch this language now. Verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Now you got the picture? And that's sort of the same illustration that I give with regard to the law. James is using the illustration that you come in from an afternoon of working in the yard, and you're sweaty and grimy, and you look in the looking glass, you look in the mirror, you see everything that needs to be done, but you don't do anything about it. You just go on out to the bathroom and you go out and do something else. Well, the mirror didn't change a thing, did it? Didn't change a thing. Well, James says this is the way it is if someone is supposed to be keeping the law and doesn't. It's just like looking in a mirror and then not responding to it. Well, now I use the mirror concept this way. The, the law... The Mosaic Law, the thou shalt nots and thou shalts are, yes, they're like a mirror. And as we look into the mirror, the law tells us everything that's wrong with us. And that's what confirms then when Paul says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The law shows that. But... Just like James' illustration of the mirror, so is my illustration of the mirror. You can look at the law of Moses and study it until you're blue in the face. Will it ever change you? No. Because the law has no redeeming power. All the law could ever do was tell a person what's wrong. 
That's all. And Paul makes that so plain in Romans chapter 3 that the law could do nothing but condemn the human race. All right, but now James isn't using that concept. James is just simply saying, you don't do what the law says to do. What a difference. All right, move on down. Back to James 1 and uh, verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Well, that's works. See, that's works. He's not saying a word about grace. It's that keeping the law. Now, we're going to see it more and more as we come on through. All right, now verse 26. If any man among you seem to be, what? Religious. Now, I think most of you and most of my audience from coast to coast and all over Oklahoma know that I don't have much time for religion. It's not a good word. It's never used in a good light, except when James uses it here, that as keepers of the law, yes, they're religious. Now, Dwight just gave me a good definition. Can I use it, Dwight? <laughs> I get all kinds of help, you know. Dwight was just giving me, before we started, a definition of religion. It's all the different ways of going to hell. <laughs> Well, you know, that's about it. Because most religion is doing exactly that. It's just simply leading people the wrong direction. You know, uh, and something like this came up in one of my letters. And all I did, you know, I try to keep them short because I, I write in longhand yet. And uh, I, I write back as short, as to the point as I can. And I just wrote back to this individual, too many people are being pied pipered. Man, I thought everybody that had been to grade school knew what that was, but the gentleman wrote back again, and he said, I don't get what you're driving at. Well, I called him then, and I said, haven't you ever heard the story? I think it took place in Europe, if I'm not mistaken, where the Pied Piper pied the pipes, and what did he do? He led, I think it was rats, wasn't it? Yeah, he led the rats all down into the river. Just literally hypnotized them. Well, you see, that's what most... That's what most of religion is doing to people today. They're pied pipering them. Oh, it sounds good. It appeals to the flesh. And they're following them like a bunch of dumb rats. Sad, but so true. All right. Now, so James is using this legal approach that if you're going to look at that perfect law of liberty, let it have an effect on your life. But Paul teaches us that the law has no power to change your life. And so here again is where I can, without apology, say James knows nothing of Paul. And that's why in my introductions I tried to make it clear that James is probably one of the first books written in our New Testament. Matthew might have beat him a little bit, but not much. So James is evidently written before the Spirit even intends him to allude to anything that Paul teaches. You just can't find it in here. I don't care how hard you look. All right, but it's still Scripture. Now, I guess I better use this verse. Come back with me, honey, to uh, Timothy. Timothy, because I don't want people to get the idea, well, Les, if it's, if it's that way out, well, why should we even look at it? Well, no, I'm not saying that. For this very reason, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. Always remember this. That even though I may maintain that this isn't written to us, that doesn't mean it's not profitable. Y'all got it? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Some of you are still looking, and I always have to remember the TV audience is right along with you. Okay, verse 16. All Scripture, all of it, from Genesis 1-1 to the last verse of Revelation, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable. See, all Scripture is profitable. For doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 
So just because James isn't addressed to us Gentiles under grace, that doesn't mean you can't profit from it. We're going to pick out little tidbits here and there that are still apropos. Well, it's the same way with the four Gospels. The four Gospels were Christ dealing with Israel. But yes, we can go into the four Gospels and we can take applications. We can feast on it. But it's not going to have basic doctrines that Paul lays out. And that's where the difference comes in at. All right, so all Scripture is given. All right, now while we're on that inspiration of Scripture, I think I should take you on over to Peter's little epistles. Second Peter, chapter 1. And here, of course, Peter agrees with the Apostle Paul 100%. Second Peter, chapter 1. No, oh my goodness, in order to understand these series of verses, I have to come all the way back to verse 16. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 16. Where now the Apostle Peter writes, For we, speaking of himself and the eleven, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Boy, does that sound familiar? See, that's what the scornful try to tell us. This is just a book of fables and legends. But Peter says, no, no, we haven't followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's he talking about there again? The soon coming of Christ? Now watch for these, see? They were all looking for the tribulation and the coming of Christ and the kingdom within a matter of 10 or 20 years, within their lifetime. I showed you that in the last taping. All right, now verse 17. For Peter says, He, Jesus the Christ, received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. And now remember, this is on the Mount of Transfiguration, back there in Matthew. All right. And so there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now Peter says, this voice, the voice from heaven, this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. That is the mount of transfiguration. Now verse 19. Oh, I love this. We have also a more sure word of prophecy or truth. How much more sure can you get than to see the Lord Jesus transfigured right in front of them, shining brighter than the noonday sun? But Peter says, I've got something even better. Now, this is something. I have, Peter says, we have a more sure word than even Christ's transfiguration, showing to those three, Peter, James, and John, who he really was. All right? We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn, that is, the return of Christ, and the day star arise in your hearts. Now here it comes. Knowing this first, that no prophecy or speaking forth of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, you can't just take a verse and build a doctrine on it. You have to use the whole from Genesis to Revelation. All right? So that knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, verse 21, here's the capstone. For the prophecy, that is the Word of God, came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God, the writers of Scripture, all of them, from Moses, who wrote the beginnings of it, on up through David, the writers of the historical books, the prophets, the writers of the gospel, Luke writing Acts, Paul's epistles, and now these by Peter, James, and John again, all of it, all of it, were holy men of God speaking as they were moved or carried along by the Holy Spirit. 
Never forget that. Every word in this book was brought about through the inspiration or the moving of these men's minds by the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't think that the Spirit dictated audibly to them, but the Spirit so took over their minds that as they wrote, or in Paul's case, most of the time he dictated to a secretary of sorts, and that mind just simply flowed with the Word of God. And that's what we have to understand. All right, so now bringing back to James that all Scripture, even these little legalistic epistles, they're still profitable, and we can glean from them. All right, now then down to verse 26 again. James 1, verse 26. And Iris, blessed her heart, asked me on the way up if I was going to finish James today. I don't think so. All right, verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious. Now, of course, that's what legalism was. Judaism was a religion. And bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is what? Vain. So what was most even Jews' religion. Vain. Because they were guilty of all these things. Now, come back with me to Galatians and we'll get Paul's use of the word religion. Back to Galatians. Chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Why right, we have to hurry. Time's gone. Galatians chapter 1, and we'll have to drop in at, uh, oh, let's just drop in at verse 13, where he's rehearsing in these verses his Damascus Road experience and his past. So verse 13 of Galatians 1, he says, You have heard of my conversation or manner of living in times past in the Jews' religion. And how that beyond measure I persecuted the assembly of God and wasted it, that is, those Jewish believers there in Jerusalem that scattered because of Paul's persecution. But what was Paul? Religious. Had no qualms about murdering people, but he was religious. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.